Hi, everybody. Welcome to November Show and Tell. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting one. Uh, we're going to do a special edition. Many of you joined us six months or so ago. When we did a recap of Milan Design Week. So today we're going to do something similar for uh, Dutch Design Week. So we're joined by a handful of our FS community members who were there on the ground, and they're going to share with you today some really inspirational um, amazing things that they saw during the course of the week and all the various activities. Uh, so we will turn it over to them in just a couple of minutes. Uh, for those of you who may be new to this, we do this on a monthly basis. Welcome if you're new to our show and tell. This is just an hour for us to kind of um, pause on everything going on in the world and come together and just share some things that are inspiring us and just try to have some great cultural conversations uh, in the course of the next hour. We love to hear what you're loving. And if you have any questions, love to hear where you're joining us from. So please do take advantage of the chat box. Just be sure to choose everyone in the pull down so that both attendees and the panelists here at FS can see your comment or your question. Just a reminder, we'll be following up with you uh, later this week with the deck from today. It's a little different than usual. Usually we have a, um, a doc of various links, but just to make it easier for you, we're gonna share with you uh, a deck that the team will be sharing today um, so that you can follow up on any things that you find super inspiring. Of course, as always, you can find previous show and tells presented by our team on our YouTube channel, as well as uh, if you're a client under the webcast portion of our site. So before we turn it over to our colleagues that went to Dutch Design Week, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ellie from our marketing team just to go over a few events that we have coming up that we hope you can join us for. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, Ellie, marketing manager here at FS. So starting um, this Monday, we are thrilled to kick off SS26 Color Week. Um, this is an exciting week dedicated to the latest color insights and seasonal intelligence. Um, the series includes um, live webinars and exclusive content for FS members. Our first webinar in the series happening on Tuesday will focus on SS26 color shifts and anchor colors. Um, this session is exclusive to our clients and will offer a deep dive into the foundational colors of the season. But if you're not a client and still want to join in, um, we are hosting a webinar on Thursday, the 14th of November. Um, and this session will cover the essential colors for fall winter 26, 27. Um, and everyone is welcome to attend. To register or find out more about Color Week, head over to fashionsnoops.com forward slash events. But after Color Week, um, mark your calendar for the 25th of November, when we'll be hosting a festive holiday webinar all about um, the 2026 holiday season for home and lifestyle. Our experts will walk you through four distinct holiday narratives, um, showing how they translate into decor, uh, tree trimmings, party supplies, packaging, and more. Um, again, to join us, you can register at fashionsnoops.com forward slash events. Um, and I'll also share the registration links in the chat box shortly. Um, we'd love to see you there. Um, but that is all for me. Uh, back over to you, Michael, to kick off today's November show and tell. Thanks, Ellie. Color Week is always a really popular week for everyone here at the FS community, so we're really excited for everyone to join us. I'm going to stop share, and I'm going to uh, take a back seat with all of you. I'm really excited, and uh, we're going to turn it over to our team here at FS that uh, is going to present everything they loved at Dutch Design Week. I'm going to turn it over to Hallie. All right. Hi, team. I'm Hallie. I'm the director of Visionary and joined by our lovely team that covered and was on the ground at Dutch Design Week. 
Um, just before we kick off, I wanted to share a little bit about the overarching theme for 2024, which was entitled Real Unreal. So it's all about helping us navigate through different realities to addressing the complexity of the challenges in the world and the need for designers to investigate and question the work, what we accept as truths. So the showcasing designers were driven by the desire to make the impossible possible together to shape another reality. And then during the week, the designers explored, questioned, and turned around what we assume to be true by making the unimaginable imaginable and more manageable. So I thought that was a beautiful kind of level set for some of the things that you'll see today, but I'll go ahead and kick it off. Um, so one of the major themes that our team identified were projects surrounding the future of food. So this whole example here um, was done by Creative Chef Studio, which is an expert in multi-sensory storytelling, really specializing in creating emotionally compelling experiences, particularly around food and dining. So these experiential recipes use a combination of experimental, these kind of like intangible ingredients, things like nature, physics, coding, music philosophy, product design, biodiversity, fashion graphics, paintings, um, anything, basically anything that you can, dis any discipline that you can imagine and connecting it to the senses, kind of things that create core memories and using that to create their design and their experiences. So the exhibition here is called Mixing Typology. So kind of combining those different elements together and it consists of different projects from immersive dining to recipes to rethinking serveware, all within the question about how will we connect with and interact with food in the future. They also during the week featured this three course um, dinner during the week. So they delved even more into this experiential experimental idea. So the guests had the opportunity to get that special experience. We didn't have the luxury of joining, but it looked really exciting and cool. Um, so some examples here include this garden tablescape. So it has live plants, even some live insects that we saw climbing all over the plates. And this is done in collaboration with the Naturalist Biodiversity Center. And this is speaking about where our crops come from and how to illustrate that in this tangible and visible way. So obviously serving the food kind of in the midst of where these crops come from, I thought was really beautiful. And I also love that the thesis of this project is that food is the most designed product that ever existed. So I think that speaks to kind of some of the themes that we saw crop up. Um, and then in relation to that, there was also this dinner sculpture project that depicts an abstract world in natural forms. So I'm so obsessed with the shapes of these dishes. Those are all actually dishes and plates meant to serve um, food off of that, but it's also meant to create a connection with the food that you're eating and also the communal act by really forcing you to interact with it in a different way and interact with the people that you're sitting around the table with in a different way for this kind of unique shared experience. But I just loved the shapes that came out of that. This other project here, one of our favorites is this cooking record. So this is in place of a traditional cookbook. Um, it was inspired by the act of crate digging, which is kind of when you're searching for the perfect vinyl in a record store, but kind of taking that and applying it to recipes. So each record holds the favorite recipe of a different artist. And there's also a QR code on the vinyl that you can play their music and the record itself features like the ingredients, as you can see, and also the recipe. But the actual record is a ceramic plate on which the food can be served. So we really loved that one. And then the last example here is just a fun um, example called skate plate, which is a reimagining of the typical plate or serving ware because it can be rolled back and forth. I'm just kind of imagining this really fun element to kind of, can you pass that dish and just like sliding it across the table, but a really fun one. And then moving on to this next one, which is called Touch Planet. So enjoy some footage of myself and Rachel playing with this next project, which as you can see, we had kind of, I guess, a lot of fun with. Um, but Magnet is this Japanese design collective and they showcased their project Touch Planet, which features a haptic games and experiments created with Hayato Tabata, who is a deaf and blind haptic designer. So this was an immersive experience, essentially a playground for the senses featuring several different haptic games that inspire communication through touch. So the first one we played here was 
basically a game of memory, but through haptic cards that had these different varying textures, really inspired by Braille. And the goal was we basically closed our eyes and we had to create as many matches as possible using only our sense of touch. There was also the sensory maids here that used these different shapes and textures to guide the movements through the pathways. And then finally, the linkage game, which you can see here. So this game actually had two versions, one with just the hand and one with the body. So it's kind of like a game of Twister where you draw two cards and based on the finger or the body part, you're meant to balance the sticks until a comp between three people. And then basically until all of the, um, the body parts or the fingers are used, it really engages your body and your mind and honestly a lot harder than it looks. We were somehow the guinea pigs of the day. So they decided to challenge us even more and kept adding more rods to more random body parts, I guess, to test our dexterity, but really fun. And what we really loved about this is the playful approach to accessibility and the invitation to communicate, collaborate, and play no matter what gender or age you are, no matter what disabilities or abilities the participant participant may have. And I also think it was just a really nice break in the day where we were using so much of our sense of sight, just kind of taking in all this gorgeous design um, and art. It was really nice to refresh and kind of ground us and allowing us to flex our other senses during the week. And then next is this project called Take Part. So this is an Amster by an Amsterdam-based designer, Iris Nyenhaas. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly, um, but she debuted her, her project Take Part, which is all about designing for connection. So another kind of theme that we saw throughout the week. Um, the goal here was to challenge conventional design practices and showcase the value of local socially responsible production by inviting audiences to engage and contribute to a work of collective art. So this interactive project combines artisanal craftsmanship with experimental techniques to create this sort of modular textile design. So the way it worked is these individual pieces that you see here, the participants could pick your part. So you choose between the four different colors and each of them represent the value that you care about the most when it comes to design. So it kind of ends up creating this visual statistic, which is super interesting, but this project in particular, so the light blue or gray one here, this piece represented product that contributes to the social integration of vulnerable groups, even if they're not perfect. And then if you chose green, it means you would stand for locally and socially produced products because they strengthen the local economy, reduce reliance on long, vulnerable and polluting supply chains and are willing to pay 30 percent more. You're willing to pay 30 percent more to support these environmentally responsible choices. The pink one here, this one means that you stood for the idea that the story behind the product is the most important to you um, rather than its price or its functionality because the people in the process involved add an extra layer to the project or to the product. And then the dark blue one meant that you believe that collaboration between the designers and social workshops lead to more creative and meaningful products as this partnership fosters diversity and inclusion. So I kind of love that those were kind of the, the staples of this piece. And I actually checked her Instagram. The last that I checked, she revealed that there's a collective of 2,061 puzzle pieces that were added over the course of Dutch Design Week. And still waiting for her final breakdown on which colors were used the most, kind of again, going back to that idea of the visual statistic and kind of seeing which values were the most important to the participants. But overall, my particular takeaway here was I just really loved about this project and many others that we saw were that this idea of fostering collaboration and participatory design is really essential to bringing people together. And it was really fun to kind of have a part in one of the pieces that was being displayed um, just as a kind of an attendee or an observer. All right, oops. My next one here is this idea or this concept or project called Prism of Self. So the artist um, it was an open studio actually and the artist was Charlotte Kammerer. So this project is talking about the boundaries between identity, space, and perception and where they dissolve. So it's exploring the complexities of self-reflection through a world of mirrors, transforming every object and surface at, to an extension of our inner lives. So through the use of steel, aluminum, and other mirrored surfaces, the viewer is faced with the idea that, objects, that the objects that we surround ourselves 
our intricate reflections, really forming a tangible prism of our inner worlds and the sometimes fragmented layers of our own identity. So besides the pieces that include furniture, decor, and serverware, the, um, the space is also immersed in this um, kind of like um, pulsating soundscape, a lot of atmospheric and echo tones, really helping to aid the introspective journey. So you can kind of see that like this DJ booth is almost set up there to emulate that. And then in this deck, which you'll get, I also linked the website, which first of all, the website design is very cool. And you can also listen to that soundscape on the website. So it's kind of, again, talking to this multi-sensory experiences that continue after the week is over. And then I have one final piece, very quick one. This is one of my favorite pieces I saw all week. I'm absolutely obsessed with this chair. I think it's so beautiful. Um, the project is called the Tyla Chair. It's from the Bahrain-based Shepherd Studio. And it's inspired by the traditional folk game of Tyla, which is basically marbles. So the chair's conceptual logic, logic stems from the notion of density as a mediator for possibility, which I think is really cool. Um, so these are hand finished and it's composed of 210 stainless steel um, spheres, all the entwined shapes, they make the chair's anatomy and then coupled with these kind of like tubular profiles and arms define the total form. But I really love the reflective finish, again, designed to complement and mirror its surroundings, which kind of, again, speaks to this idea of reflection, both literally and figuratively, really kind of talking about this, um, how it's entwined in the design. And then with that, I will hand it over to Rachel. For ah, thank you so much, Hallie. Um, and I also wanted to mention, uh, Hallie's mentioning quite a few of the themes that we have from the Dutch Design Week. And I think one, if not two of our reports will be going live today. So we have first our sustainability report, which Emma will speak to a bit later today. Uh, and then we also, oh, someone's at my door, perfect timing. And then we also have our major themes report uh, today as well, which dives into some of those themes, as Hallie mentioned, regarding collaboration. Uh, we touch a little bit on sustainability, upcycling. So all these different themes that we saw popping up at Dutch Design Week. Uh, and with that, I'll get started. So my name is Rachel. I'm the director of Active. I'm based here in Rotterdam. So shout out to all of the Netherlands crew that joined today. I see you in the chat. Uh, so our first project here that we wanted to speak to is called Common Goods. So this was an art project that we visited, and it's really made to challenge what it means to own clothing. So instead of selling their jackets, they're meant to be shared and passed along with each layer of the wear, adding new character and a sense of shared history. So when you receive the jacket and you make repair, you add a stitch, then you send it to the next person. They have that little piece of you included along with the jacket. So a little bit more about the jacket itself. Um, they're inspired by Ticino Blueprint, which is a traditional Swiss textile technique that involves block printing and deep indigo dye. So each piece is carefully crafted over several months. So truly highlighting that beautiful, almost forgotten art history, artistry that we love. Uh, and the jackets are super limited edition. So there's only eight that were created. So wearing one really felt like connecting to something super rare and really meaningful. Each jacket is really a unique artifact because it's shared and it really gathers the stories along the way. I think Hallie described it like the sister of the traveling pants in a way with this short jacket, which I also really loved. Um, and then at Dutch Design Week, they had an interactive workshop. So the visitors could stitch the reflections on the theme um, of sharing onto scraps of fabric from the jackets. And then the stitch reflections will later be combined to make a whole new jacket, really representing everyone's thoughts on communal ownership. Uh, and then overall community common goods, it really felt like this invitation to rethink how we connect with our clothing and of course with each other. So these jackets are not just wearable, but they're also evolving. They're communal works of art and they capture both personal and collective history. Uh, so this is one of the projects that we featured within our report. So if you're a client, you can read a little bit more on this project later on today. And then we can move along to the next one here. So speaking of color week, obviously we really love color here at FS and we know just how important it is. Uh, so we wanted to highlight this project called Colors of a Forest because we enjoyed it so much. When me and Hallie walked into the room, we're like, oh, we are home. Um, so this artist, her name is Tina Steiger and she's a designer and color researcher. And she leads a group, some, something she calls the Embassy of Color, uh, where she explores colors, cultural and emotional depth. 
Uh, her work really aims to reconnect us to the natural significance of color beyond its commercial use and really looking at nature for the inspiration. So one of her standout projects, again, this is called The Color of a Forest, and it really dives into those changing hues um, of a local forest right there in Eindhoven. So over a full year, the project documented how the forest colors evolved through each season, culminating in a really unique seasonal color wheel that truly captures the visual cycle of the year through these beautiful hues. Um, and each week, she noticed subtle shifts in the forest palettes that were observed and cataloged from the fresh pale greens of spring to those darker, richer greens of summer. And finally, to hopefully what you're looking at now, those deep earthy tones of autumn. So this ongoing record highlights how nature's colors reflect both growth and decay by following the forest natural rhythm of color. And we also really love this project because it's a glimpse at a living color uh, and native color as well. So the result is this distinctive color wheel that showcases the forest's annual journey. So the colors are more than just a collection of hues. It's really a visual story of the forest life cycle, offering a glimpse into the beauty of nature's continuous transformation. And the colors of the forest also serves as a reminder of how color evolves in harmony with our environment. So inviting us to appreciate the forest subtle seasonal changes. Uh, we love this project because it really encourages a deeper connection to the natural world by viewing color as an essential part of life's rhythms. So again, this project was called The Colors of a Forest and we really, really love this one. I think we included that within some of our reports later today as well. Uh, the next project here, uh, if you're on this webinar and you know me already, this is a very Rachel project. Uh, so this is from an artist whose name is Eros uh, Reseglion, um, and he's an empathetic designer based in Eindhoven. So he explores the relationship between humans and nature, particularly by listening to plants. Um, so he's a 2023 graduate of the Design Academy, and he's dedicated to creating these eco-conscious installations that use natural and biodegradable materials. Uh, and this project is called the Plant Slater, which I also really love. Um, it's an innovative installation designed to translate the plant signals into sound. Uh, it's inspired by a unique connection with a special hill. Uh, and he developed this tool to listen to plants, turning their bioelectric signals into sounds that reveal patterns that we just can't hear. This process opens up fresh perspectives on understanding and appreciating nature on a deeper level. So during Dash Design Week, uh, visitors could experience the plants later <laughs> firsthand. So listening to the local plants through these headphones that translate the plants bioelectric uh, activity in cities, beautiful one-of-a-kind symphonies. And this interaction really symbolizes the unity and highlights the state of nature. So offering this unique sensorial way to connect with the surrounding environment. Uh, and this was set within an architectural space that were filled with plants and biomatter. Uh, this installation really transformed the room into a natural environment. So embodying themes of spatial justice and solidarity it also created a bridge between urban settings and the natural world. So really reminding us all of this interconnectedness around us. And then through the plant Slater, uh, Rosiglioni hopes to deepen our awareness of the bonds between us and living things. So by hearing the voices of the plants, uh, this project invites us to reflect on our relationship with nature and promotes a more harmonious balance between humans and the environment. And I see someone in the chat speaking about mushrooms with neocons, so we need the link to that, please, in the chat. I wanna learn more. And then in our next artist here, uh, so I wanted to continue the theme of sound because that was something that we saw, as Hallie mentioned earlier, with the ceramic plates where you can get uh, a QR code for the sound uh, when you're cooking. We noticed a lot of soundscapes and how artists were incorporating sound and music within their work as well. So this project uh, I really enjoyed as well. This is from an artist who name is Colette Aleman. Uh, she's a sound musician and artist, and she uses her work to explore these deep connections to nature and also environmental change. And this latest project uh, is called Shift, and it builds on this mission of combining the art, science, and sound to communicate the urgency of climate awareness. Uh, so Shift is an electroacoustic EP created in collaboration with climate modular Tim van der 
Erker during a nine month fellowship with the Collaborations for Future. So this project here translates all the climate data from Antarctica into sound and projecting what the ice sheets may experience up to 1000 years into the future. The result is a really compelling soundscape that allows the listeners to connect emotionally with environmental change. Uh, and this was made using custom built tools in Pure Data uh, with Colette transforming that complex data from Tim's ice sheet models into these beautifully rich textured sounds. And part of the album features these data driven sounds that are weaving oscillators with those field recordings to really bring the potential future of Antarctica to life. The other half of the album presents um, Aleman's own soundscapes, accompanied by reflective lyrics on a world facing rapid transformation. What was really cool also was the presentation. So this limited edition album was revealed by a melting glacier, physically embodying the themes of the climate change. These objects floated along a path of glacial runoff and were later showcased at the Collaborations for Future during the Dutch Design Week Festival. Uh, and I love that it was featured as a, as a cassette tape, which is not something you see quite often, um, but each one of them comes with a small publication documenting Aleman's conversations with Tim, so capturing insights from their time working together on this exploration project. And then this SHIFT project also builds on some of her previous soundscape projects continuing the exploration of sound as a bridge to connect with nature and climate change. So this particular project invited listeners to experience the sounds of a shifting earth. So really encouraging our own reflection on the environmental changes that are shaping the world around us. Uh, and some of the track names I thought were interesting as well. Uh, they were thickness, velocity, uh, and flotation. So each really capturing the different aspects of Antarctica's ice, ice movements and the shifting landscapes. Uh, and what's really interesting about this project, it's a musical experience, but also at the end of the day, it's a call to really consider the future of our planet. And then in our next one here, going a little bit more into the wellness area. So Dash Design Week was really over, overwhelming and stimulating in the best possible way. But when our team found this digital wellness center, we welcomed it with open arms. So this was um, an installation at Dutch Design Week and it was sponsored by the Next Nature Museum. So they offered a breathing session as a way to step out of the festival's really high energy atmosphere and place themselves into a space of calm and focus. Uh, this session provided really, again, that much needed break and reset from the overwhelming notifications, screens, and constant activity that we face on a daily basis. So the session here included gentle breathing exercises in a dimly lit room, uh, really designed to help the attendees clear their minds and settle into that moment of calm. There were really soft, soothing lights, completely peaceful atmosphere. We really had a chance to unwind and rest. Besides the yoga mat and the pillow, I think the only thing else in the room was this giant sculpture of an iPhone that was translating the light. Um, but in some way it was quite peaceful. I, I can't explain it. So this experience really served as an introduction also to the Next Nature's Digital Wellness Center, which will open in December, so next month, uh, if you're around to check it out. Uh, and again, this was designed for a response to that digitally overloaded world and really let people step away from their screens. Um, again, finding the rhythm of the shaman that was the iPhone in this room. Uh, and they also offered a breathing session during Dutch Design Week. So this was led um, by a breathwork expert as well. So visitors left really recharged, ready to dive back into that creative energy of Dutch Design Week. Uh, and also it was, uh, it wanted to highlight the importance of rest and recovery in our fast paced digital world, uh, while also making for a memorable experience at the festival. And we dive into a little bit more of these meditative places that were set throughout the festival, which I also really appreciated, not something I see at too many design festivals, but these moments and these places that are set aside just for these moments of calm and recharge as well. So another topic we explore a bit deeper in our reports. And then I think I have just one more here. Um, this was another one that was a uh, favorite. It was something that we stumbled in upon and it really left an impression. Uh, and this is something that also has an app uh, as well. So even if you didn't go to the festival, you can download the app to participate. This was called the Dream Gaze Experience. Uh, so Dream Gaze uses AI to help uh, better 
discover the meaning and dive a bit deeper within your dreams. So it uses the AI to analyze recurring themes, emotions, and symbols. And the app guides the users through these self-reflective prompts that offer a new way to connect with their subconscious and explore personal growth. So rather than giving fixed interpretations, what DreamGaze does is it encourages you to explore your own insights and connections within your dreams. So with thought-provoking questions, the app helps you really uncover these maybe hidden emotions, desires, worries, whatever it is, really making it a personal and intuitive tool for self-exploration. I agree, a little scary, but also super fun, depending on your dream. Uh, de decades of research also, sh also show that our dreams are closely tied to mental well-being. So these dreams often reflect our inner emotional world. So by capturing and reflecting upon these dreams, we gain a, gain a better understanding of our mental state and tap into valuable aspects of our own subconscious. Uh, and for the first week, um, first weekend, sorry, at the Dutch Design Week, they invited a professional dream analyst um, at the installation to help the visitors further interpret and reflect on their dreams. So it made a really unique opportunity to dive a bit deeper with a dream expert, really tap into maybe what your subconscious might be trying to communicate. Um, and again, there's an app, so you can download it. I think it only works for iPhone now, but it's really bridging that gap between technology and self-awareness. Um, the fact that they bring the AI in with the dream journaling, it gives a new approach to understanding ourselves and maybe to view dreams as something a little bit more meaningful to gain a little bit more of that personal insight. The experience here, as you can see in this photo, you went into a really calm sort of booth with pillows and you dictated a dream or maybe a nightmare. Uh, and then the AI released a little uh, condensed statement and they even offered a glimpse and imagery to accompany your dream. So we thought this was a really interesting uh, addition into the normal design design activities at Dutch Design Week. And uh, yeah, check it out, see if it works. Hopefully not too scary, but maybe it'll add a little bit of fun your way. And with that, I'll pass it to Emma. We'll speak a bit more on sustainability. Thank you, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. I am Emma. This is actually my first show and tell for the company because I am the new director of sustainability here. So as you might expect, everything I'm about to talk through kind of explores the tenets of kind of more responsible design. First up is this really beautiful piece called The Matter We Share by Steffi de Gaetano and Julia Pomplich. And it was actually part of Dutch Design Week's Soils exhibition, which focused on the relationship that we as humans really have with kind of the soil that we rely on for everything from food to fashion. And the matter we share shines a spotlight on industrial pollution specifically, industrial pollution in our soils, and more specifically, the industrial pollution of Eindhoven's River Dommel, which runs through the city. And it actually makes a comment on how this environmental degradation of our soils is linked to and can be linked to macro histories of things like colonialism, land dispossession and industrial extractions. So the canvas that you can see here on the screen, which I just absolutely love, actually depicts the journey of the river through the city itself. And its colouring comes from experimentations with soil chromatography that used earth that they sourced directly from the river and the surrounding land. And the result really isn't meant to be a representation of kind of the existing pollution in the river, but actually a tracking of the contamination that's happened through time. And ultimately a message, which Rachel's already touched on, that we must kind of invest a lot more in our beyond human connections to really keep both the world and ourselves healthy. On the next slide is a spotlight on a really key theme that we saw emerge across the show, and that's the concept of decentralized energy, or I suppose how we as individuals might be able to become much more energy independent as the climate crisis and also geopolitical strife across the world kind of brings that consistent and reliable energy access into question more and more. And what was lovely is there was a number of lo-fi but really beautifully designed solutions on show. So at the top is Jade Fritz's Treatment for Reconnection Chair. It's actually just made out of clay, fiber and sand, and it's designed to heat the seated person up via direct contact with it. 
So it takes kind of inspiration from the ancestral concepts of localized fire, and it can store heat for a number of hours because of those natural properties, and then gently release it slowly throughout the day when you actually need to warm up your body. And on the left is Ludwig Carlsen's tiled freestanding heating panels, which I absolutely adored. And they are, again, kind of promote the idea of that localized heat. So rather than heating entire spaces and using all of this energy, let's just heat ourselves or the areas that we actually need to be heated up and save the energy that we might not always have to hand moving forward. Um, they are inspired by kind of tiled stoves. So when a stove used to be the center of a home and that's where the heat source came from and they can be really easily moved around the, ha the house. So kind of wherever you need the heat, you can place the tiled pillar. And then on the bottom right is from Carolina Baraka and it's called A Layer In Between. It's actually a collection of modular textile pieces, which kind of double as interior design. So whenever you don't need it as a, as a heating element, I suppose. But they also have a double kind of meaning or a double purpose whereby they could be used to protect the body against the cold when it's needed. So the back panel is actually a wall tapestry, which doubles up as padding against cold brick walls if you do need to have that in your home. And then onto the next slide is a collection called Landscape. Um, and this is a textile collection which really shows just how brilliant nature can be as a partner in, the, in our creative processes, which is a theme we saw emerging across the week and I dive into in a lot more detail in the dedicated sustainability report that will be live on the site fairly soon. Um, this is by designer Maria Di Kestra, and she involved nature as a real active agency in her entire design process, which included things like burying jacquard woven textiles under the forest floor for several months so they could be naturally dyed by both the soil and all its many elements. And then other pieces of textile, like the ones on the right, were collaboratively dyed with Swedish lakes and the ocean. And then on to the next slide is another example of kind of using what nature gives us. And this comes from a designer called Ella Einhell, and it's called Pass the Bone. So Einhell kind of noticed, even though she's a vegetarian, just as a caveat to this, um, that there's a huge issue of bone waste in the global meat industry. And she kind of thought how she could utilize this very available resource that's always discarded as waste in a different way and actually put it to use. And she's come up with zero waste bone glass, which you can see here on the right hand side. This is actually a modern take on milk glass, which has been around for centuries. And it's made from byproduct bones that she sources from local farmers in Germany that really practice ethical hus husbandry. So each piece of glass that she makes is really visually informed by the bone from which it comes, meaning that no two pieces are the same. And it really tells that story of both the animal, but also the natural history of the kind of core raw materials that she's used. And some of her other work all around the kind of concept of using bones and using this waste kind of look at how bone ash, for example, could be used in the ceramics industry, but also terrazzo industries to replace some of the key resources that we use from sand to silica. But also she looks at the resurgence of something called bone carving, which apparently used to be quite a popular kind of not pastime, but, you know, role, I suppose, um, where you actually use whole bones in the design process. And you can see that here on the left hand side where the entire kind of bone or element of the bone has been used to create this beautiful object for the home. And then on the next side is just the last one from me. And it's a spotlight on paper. Um, I'm obsessed with paper and, and kind of what it can do. Um, and specifically wanted to draw attention to these two designers because they really seem to have pushed the limits of kind of what we expect paper to look and feel like. And they really demonstrate its potential as a material far beyond, I think, what we consider it to be today. So on the left is the beautiful work by Malu Rattan and Mariek van der Ven. It's a light fixture and it's called Jakari and it's crafted from a 3D woven textile that's made with paper yarn. So this really sculptural object emphasizes that natural drape of the material, but also kind of the moldability of paper based yarns to create something that's really structural and really intriguing. And then on the right, we have Rosa Lutzen's unfolding paper which is a collection of woven paper 
sorry, woven paper yarn-based textiles again that are designed to enrich our interior spaces. So kind of like wall separators and so on, room separators. And again, you can see here the drape of the paper is really emphasized as alongside kind of the stiffness that the paper brings to this material that really helps create this kind of stunning three-dimensional form. So as I mentioned, all of that and a lot more is in the dedicated sustainability kind of report roundup. And I'm going to hand over to Tamara for the last section of the takeaways. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Tamara Escaviche, and I'm the Senior Strategist for Activewear here at FS. And I was lucky enough to be able to join the team at um, Dutch Design Week. And I was really, truly inspired and blown away by all the amount of insightful, inspiring projects. And um, yeah, I'm super happy that I can share some of my favorites with you today. So um, first up, we went to the Microlab section where we visited the exhibition by uh, Tsune Quartier or the Shoe Quarter, which is a museum that is focused on the shoe and leather industry and, you know, talks about how footwear evolves over time, changes due to zeitgeist and also their impact on culture. So um, they have some uh, young artists in residence and they showcase some of their projects during design um, Dutch Design Week. And it was really interesting because actually when we were there, um, the, um, the designers and artists were there as well and they walked us through their projects. So that was really um, a special moment. So um, first up on the top left, we have design from Maxime Verhul. Um, so he wants to celebrate the historical significance of the wooden clocks and especially for the Netherlands and what they could mean in a more modern interpretation. So his project was called Walking on Wood. And uh, here the artist really invites wooden clocks back into a more urban setting, wanting to bridge the gap between history, craft, innovation and more contemporary lifestyles, but also wanting to look into introducing more natural material materials into the footwear industry. So the designer was explaining that to, to be able to have wooden clock be worn in a more urban setting, the comfort level needed to be guaranteed, of course. So um, he started manufacturing these, thinking about supporting specific pressure points of the feet, um, elevating the comfort level. So he added some cushioning and um, as well aesthetically wise, to give them a more contemporary look, um, he added some element of sneaker designs like laces and other closure system, really creating this very unique and unexpected um, creations. Another really great project came from Stephanie Rolf and Sophia Fenlon. Uh, we were looking to create a mono material library for practical disassembly and recycling. And being from the active department, that's definitely music to our um, ears, as we are always, uh, you know, looking for projects or artists that puts this idea of made to be remade and disassembled at the forefront, especially in conversation about uh, recyclability and circularity. So um, Rolf and uh, Fenlon are both textile designers and they wanted to showcase um, how monomaterial designs, so products that are composed out of one single material, can achieve diverse textures, forms and functions throughout engineered um, use of woven structures. So you can see on the designs on the bottom left image where they focus on jacquard and dobby weaving to create um, these uppers, um, Again, creating very really unique pieces that challenge really this idea of traditional footwear um, design. They are all engineered on loom, um, so they can really target areas of flexibility and cushioning. Um, another artist that were really focusing on technique and craftsmanship of design and materiality was Joris de Groot. Um, so he researched the connection between craftsmanship and industrial processes for this project. Um, and especially focusing on the car interior um, industry. So once he gets kind of like familiar with the industry, the existing techniques and processes that surround him, he kind of like experiments with what is available uh, in materials and machinery to find new use. So as you can see in the press shoe on the middle um, top image, um, he kind of like um, utilized, you know, um, tires, but also upholstery from um, the car industry, really translating them all to this um, design, even like, you know, finishing finishing procedures of car mats that are a little bit more rounded and edgy. Um, he kind of like utilize, utilize it all into um, creating these really special um, creations. So he um, also showcased another project at the show in collaboration with Knit in Motion, which is um, a consultancy studio by um, knit designer Susan Odehengel, which is also one of our favorites here at um, FS. And uh, they presented a welded um, loop, as you can see in the video in the middle. 
and they are exploring the innovative use of thermoplastic polyurethane in shoe design by integrating knitting, welding, and 3D printing techniques. Um, so again, uh, with the idea of keeping like the functionality of um, footwear um, at the front, but also evaluating more um, recyclable and environmentally friendly uh, materials. Um, and also experimenting with more 3D um, designs and techniques is designer Christian uh, Ristov. He developed a project that investigates the use of biomimicry in reimagining the way shoes are designed and made. So more specifically, he was looking at how animals use specialized body parts and biological structure to adjust to their surroundings. So for example, animal um, feet come in many shapes and forms depending on their habitat and the level of grip that they would need to basically survive. And he kind of like adapts that functionality, but also aesthetically wise into their designs, which you can see in the top uh, right. What was also very impressive is that he kind of sculpted this design in a VR environment, completely rethinking again how we design footwear, um, which he described as a more intuitive way of designing, um, which he then uh, printed out his design in uh, through a 3D printer. He also has a lot of footwear attachment that he designed that could be added on and taken off, again, um, responding to the needs of rapid changing environments, which I thought was really great. So we can move to the next one. Um, so I tagged along with Emma uh, during my stay. So a lot of sustainability projects uh, from my part as well that I thought was, were really interesting. So um, we went to Bio Art Labor Laboratories, um, which had a whole exhibition exploring the coexistence um, and our connection to nature, which was called the Symbiocene Forest. And um, it looked at how we as humanity lived in harmony with nature and deep dives into all of the symbiotic um, relationship between humans, technology, and the environment, and doing this in more sustainable ways. So um, here I wanted to highlight the work of Andrea Britnick. Um, for the project, I was called Tactile uh, Whiteness Equilibrium with Mycelium. The artist created a series of artworks in which she uh, wanted to interpret the coexistence and co-molding of mutually generative processes of living organisms, natural materials, and human beings. So she created an interactive experiment on the top um, left in which uh, UV light reveals invisible fruiting organism hiding behind mycelium. So you kind of like step, stepped into this uh, light proof cabbing where you can see like you know all these wide forms um, but then when the the light was switched um, on you could um, see this kind of like living organism almost coming to life so a uh, really cool project um, and another one that was really interesting was from um, Linting Min on the right uh, which was called Untamed Fluorescence um, so um, she wanted to transform the time-lapse photography of flo flower growth into a series of paper lamps. So basically, we most of the time think of flowers as very delicate, very ephemeral. And she wanted to kind of like showcase the drastic force of growth within flowers um, on a very concentrated time scale and demonstrate their basically growth trajectory during their whole um, lifetime. Um, so it kind of like had this sense of uh, wildness into the design, uh, revealing kind of like that untamed tension and eliminating that kind of like passive quality that we attribute to plants, which I thought uh, was a really refreshing perspective. Um, and lastly, we have the project of Nosh uh, Nene uh, with Reef uh, Flux, which uh, wants to draw attention to decay and transformation. So the artist combined enduring fossils with transient uh, sculptures that were made from different algae materials. Um, so the fossilized elements are inspired by intricate patterns and forms of endangered coral species that serve as a reminder of the ancient history and future vulnerability of our coral ecosystems. And I thought it was just interesting to see the kind of like blend of technology, science and nature um, in creating this really um, interesting artworks, blending again, kind of the past and future aesthetic, but also kind of like this natural and supernatural um, aesthetics. And we can move on to my last slide. Um, so this one is about the new order of fashion exhibit that was entitled From the Source. Um, and uh, where through you know, visionary, visionary designs and immersive workshop, um, the entity wanted to explore how regener gener regenerative fashion can restore ecosystem and reconnect us back with nature 
showcasing work on reg regenerative thinking and rethinking our relationship with our resources. So first up, um, the work of Estonian fashion designer Carol Ott with her project Carried Away, uh, which is in the first image on the left. Um, and it's based on the idea that every fisherman has a fishing coat, uh, which protects them from weather and the sea. And over time, it kind of like gets covered with salt, algae, microorganisms. So basically, life that is from the ocean or from the sea. Um, so the code basically tells a story. Um, the code will never be new or clean. Um, so it's definitely, you know, something that you keep for a lifetime. So the designer crafted this code based on that idea, looking at abstract shapes from the seaside and use, uh, utilizing algae-based bioplastics so that the fishing code originates from the sea and can be become part of it again at the end of its life cycle, heading basically back to the source. Um, another project that I found really fascinating was were the biodegradable buttons that were made with Rami waste by bio, bio designer Bei Bei Tang. Um, so Rami is one of the main agricultural economies um, into the designer's hometown and a crop that is unique to the southwest of China. Um, the fibers are mostly used to develop a linen-like um, textile, but because culture is in decline and climate change, um, the designer is exploring you know, the potential of the plant beyond its fibers. Um, and part of the project was to solve kind of like the secondary utilization of Rami waste besides fiber. So they extracted microcrystalline cellulose from Rami through experiments, which then became one of the main ingredients for making these buttons. Um, and, um, you know, she sees it applied on fully biodegradable garments, um, textile dyes also with Rami leaves and roots, really utilizing all the available resources to the fullest. And lastly, we have a piece of the Mara collection by clothing and textile designer Neza Simkik. Um, and in this piece, we have a wood, leather, linen yarn applied by ancestral methods of woodenware, sieve, and basket making. So Simkik explores the gradual disappearance of this kind of like ancestral techniques and really wants to showcase the value of these more traditional methods, not only as kind of like a counter movement for fast fashion, but also to foster cultural diversity, inclusiveness, and community ties. So we are definitely always uh, looking um, to these more ancestral techniques here at FS and how, you know, they can find, help find solutions um, or foster ideas for um, future problems. So really looking at that intersect intersection of past, present, and future. So I, I thought I would definitely share this one. And yeah, that was it uh, for me. Yeah, I think that wraps it up. Um, I can hand it back over to you, Ash and Ellie. I'll take it from you, Hallie. Thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate your beautiful insight, Hallie and Rachel and Emma and Tamara. Great to be inspired for this hour. We'll follow up with you guys later this week with this deck so that you can dive into all these really beautiful things on your own. Um, if you have any questions about how FS could possibly support you or your creative team, feel free to drop us an email at hello at fashionsnoops.com. We are always happy to hear from you and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, we'll see you the first Wednesday in December for our very last show and tell of 2024. And um, thank you, grateful to our creative community for today's show and tell, and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care of yourselves.